postponed. This is the only one that has gone on on the date that it was at originally planned. And pulling that off is a tremendous feat, especially because of all the computer stuff that needs to be taken care of. So I think they deserve a great round of applause. And so I'm going to clap for them. You can clap even with your, oh, good, somebody put up a clap my meme, rather. Right, I said mime, that tells you what age I am. Very good, yeah. So thank you so much to Aaron and Josh. And let me tell you what I'm gonna be talking about. So, oh yeah, lots of applause come through on the chat, excellent. So um, here's an outline of the talk. I'm gonna start by making sure that we understand all of the words in the title of the talk. And once I've done that, I'm going to focus on telling you what the chromatic polynomial is because that's the star of this little play. And one of the things that I love about the chromatic polynomial is that it has this tendency to show up in places where a priori it has no business being. It just kind of appears out of nowhere. And I'm going to give you two examples of that, classical examples of that, one having to do with acyclic orientations and one having to do with hyperplane arrangements. And then in my own research recently, true to form, we were studying something that didn't have anything to do with the chromatic polynomial and up it popped. So that's going to be the subject of uh, the fourth section on increasing forests. And then finally, I'm going to end with a section about comments and some open questions that if you're interested in this material, I encourage you to work on. Um, if you want to find out more about this subject, you can surf over to my website, uh, easy to get to, just Google Bruce Sagan, and um, you'll find copies both of these slides and also of all my research papers to which I'll refer during the talk. So let's get started. What, what are the words in the title mean? Well, uh, I hope I don't need to define the, that should be pretty clear, but what does protein mean? Protein is not something you hear every day. Well, the word comes from Proteus, which was one of the Greek gods of sea and water. So, right, if you have water and you put it into any container, it takes the shape of that container. So protein means changeable, shape-shifting, malleable. So here is an artist's conception of what Proteus might have looked like. I cannot guarantee that this is accurate, but I thought it was a fun dry, drawing. What about, oh, thank you, Jasmine. I'm glad you liked the joke. I will be making jokes throughout the talk to make sure that you're at least enjoying this and hopefully also following the talk as well. So um, the other next word is chromatic and despite the fact that i am a musician chromatic here has nothing to do with the musical scale chromatic is talking about color so here's a colorful annulus and then the last word of the title is polynomial and i certainly don't need to tell people in this audience what a polynomial is but it may not be clear what a chromatic polynomial is so that's our next order of business what is the chromatic polynomial Okay, so basic definitions then. So we're going to start with G, which is a combinatorial graph. So the, that means we're going to have a set V of vertices and a set E of edges. And so the edges can be thought of as lines connecting the vertices. So here's a simple example. In this graph, we have four vertices, U, V, X, and W and also four edges. So there's an edge connecting U and V, so I write that as UV, edge connecting U and X, so I write UX, et cetera, et cetera. And you might as well get up close and personal with this graph because you're gonna be seeing a lot of it during this talk. This is gonna be our standard go-to example. Okay, so that's what a graph is. What does it mean to color a graph? Well, a coloring of a graph is just a function from the vertex set to some set C1 through CT, which you can think of as a set of colors or numbers or what have you. But anyway, you assign each vertex one of the elements of this set, and that's called a coloring. And we're mainly going to be concerned with, with what are called proper colorings. So a coloring is proper 
if whenever you have an edge, say u from u to v, the colors that you assign to its endpoints are different. So the color of u cannot be the color of v if u and v are connected by an edge. Okay. So let's go back and make sure this is clear by looking at the example. So here is a coloring of this graph with three colors, blue, red, and black. And it's proper. No edge has the same colors on it. This one isn't proper, right? Because now that central diagonal edge has both endpoint blue, and that's not permitted. I hope it's clear what it means by proper coloring, because if it's not, you might as well go to sleep for the rest of this talk, because this is we're going to be talking a lot about proper colorings. Are there any questions? about the definition so far. Okay, nobody popped up, so I'm assuming so far so good, which is great. So one of the, oh yes, I'm getting some thumbs up. Yay, that means you're with me. I like it, I like it a lot. Thank you, Jesse, and the rest. Okay, and, and Keshev. Uh, I'm sorry for massacring your name probably. Anyway, so, one invariant of a graph is what's called its chromatic number, and it's denoted chi of g, and it's the smallest number of colors that you can use to properly color the graph. Right, so we want to be as efficient as possible and use the smallest number of colors. I claim that the chromatic uh, number, whoopsie, that was a little bit too far. I claim that the chromatic number of this graph is three. Well, we can certainly color it with three colors, right? Because on the left there, I showed you a proper coloring with three colors. Why can't we do better? Why can't we use just two colors? Well, think about it. This graph has a triangle. Is there a way to color a triangle with two colors? No, all three vertices of that triangle have got to get different colors, so three is the best possible. And perhaps one of the most famous theorems in all graph theory and perhaps in all of mathematics is what's called the four color theorem. So the four color theorem, which was proved by Kenneth Apple and Wolfgang Hocken in 1976, says that if a graph is planar, that is to say it can be drawn in the plane such that no two of the edges cross, then its chromatic number is at most four. Often people say four colors suffice. Now, let me, this is an incredible theorem from several aspects. First of all, if we don't assume planar, then the chromatic number can be as big as we like. Because think about it, suppose we take n vertices and we take the graph where every pair of vertices is connected. Well, then clearly that graph needs n colors, right? Every vertex has got to have a different color because every vertex is adjacent to every other vertex. And we can let n be as big as we like. So the fact that we can get away with four colors if the graph is planar, for any planar graph, no matter how big, that's surprising. Second, this had been the four color conjecture for over a hundred years. So when they proved it, it was a big deal. And the other thing that made it a really big deal was this was the first theorem to heavily use computers in its proof. There were just, it's, turns into a case by case analysis and there were just too many too many cases to do by hand so and i remember this this was while i was in graduate school there was a lot of discussion in the mathematical community is this a real proof when it can't be checked by a human and i think today there would be no question that it was a real proof but back then this was a real point of contention and um Anyway, so this is Kenneth Oppel and Wolfgang Hocken, uh, both much older than they were when they proved the theorem. In fact, I should mention this very conference had Kenneth Oppel as one of its invited speakers shortly after he proved the theorem. So you can think of this talk, if you like, as a sequel to Oppel's talk 45 years later. Okay. But notice the chromatic number is an extremal type 
object, right? It's asking for the minimum number of colors. I do a numerative combinatorics. I like to count things. So I'm going to turn this into a counting problem as follows. So I'm going to define the chromatic polynomial of a graph to be the number of proper colorings that I get if I have a set with T colors. So that's denoted P of G or P of G T if I want to denote the number of colors I'm allowed to use. Now it's not at all clear why we should call this a chromatic polynomial, but let's go back to our example and see what happens. Now, this example is simple enough that we can just go around and color the vertices in order. So I'm going to start in the upper left-hand corner with U and then just start coloring around the graph, U, V, W, X. How many choices do we have to color the vertex U? Well, I claim there are T choices. I mean, there could have been coffee, but... It's T in this particular case. Why are there T choices? Well, think about it. I've got T colors. Oh, LOL. Very good, Kyle. Um, there's, right? We've got T colors and we just started coloring, so there's no restrictions. So I can slap any one of the T colors down on vertex U. How many choices are there when we get to vertex V? Well, Yes, Alex got it, T minus one, right? Because think about it, right? I can put any color on V except the color that I used on U because it's adjacent to U. In a similar manner, when I get to W, I'm gonna have T minus one colors. What about X? Well, hopefully you can see that there's T minus two choices here, why? X is adjacent to both U and V, and we know U and V are different colors because they're connected. So that leaves T minus two choices for X. So what's the total? The total is just the product of these linear factors. And if you multiply that out, you get T to the fourth minus four T cubed plus five T squared minus two T. Lo and behold, this is a polynomial in T. Now, this, of course, does not prove that this is always a polynomial in T, but we're going to do that shortly. But at least it works in this example. Let me make a few more comments before we prove that this is a polynomial in T. First of all, the chromatic polynomial is closely related to the chromatic number in the following way. The chromatic number is the smallest positive integer such that if you plug it in for T into the chromatic polynomial, you get a positive number. Why is that? Well, think about it. By definition, chi of g is the smallest number of colors that you can use and get a proper coloring. So if p of g counts the number of proper colorings, then if I plug in chi of g, it'll count at least one proper coloring, and so it'll be positive. What will happen if I plug in a number smaller than chi of g? Well, again, chi of g is the minimum number of colors. So if I plug in a, if I'm taking a smaller number of coloring colors, there is no proper coloring with that number of colors because it's smaller than chi of g. And so if I plug such a number in, when p tries to count, it won't find any and it'll spit back zero. The last thing I wanted to say is that this example is a little bit special because it's so small. It's not necessarily the case that P of G needs to be to factor over the integers, that it's a product of factors of the form T minus K integers K. And to see what can go wrong, <coughs> excuse me, to see what can go wrong, let's look at this cycle. And we're gonna color the cycle in exactly the way we did before going around so we start with U, there's T choices as before. Go to V, there's T minus one choices as before. We go to W, there's T minus one choices as before. But now look at X. Now we got a problem. What, what's the problem? Well, the problem is X is adjacent to both U and W. Now, if U and have the same color, they could have the same color because they're not adjacent, then there's T minus one choices for X. 
But if U and W have different colors, then there's T minus two choices for X. Which one are we gonna choose? It's not at all clear, okay? So we've now got, so we're gonna try and solve this problem of coloring the cycle and also prove that this is a polynomial and we're gonna do it using perhaps the most useful tool in graph coloring, which is called deletion contraction. So suppose I've got a graph, suppose I've got an edge, then G backslash E is going to be G with E deleted. So you just remove E from the edge set. That's simple enough. G over E or forward slash E is going to be G with E contracted to a vertex. So you think of E as a rubber band and its endpoints come together, a nice homotopy, and form a new vertex V sub E. That new vertex is then adjacent to any vertices that were adjacent to the endpoints of the original edge. Now notice this means that you could get doubled edges because right, if the original edge, both of its endpoints were adjacent to a vertex and I contract, then I'll get two edges coming into the new vertex just replace those doubled edges by single edges so we stay within the realm of graph theory. So that's just what I said about the multiple edges. Again, an example is worth a thousand definitions. Let's look at this example with that edge in mind. So if I delete it, <laughs> clearly get, <coughs> excuse me, just the four side of path with four vertices there. What happens if I contract it? Well, then, V and X come together in the center, and that new vertex V sub E is going to be adjacent to W, right? Because the original edge had its endpoint V adjacent to W. And U is also going to be adjacent to the new vertex, right? Because U is adjacent to both V and X, but it doesn't give me a double edge, it just collapses to a single edge. Questions about how deletion and contraction work? Is it clear? Because this, this is going to be very important for us in a sec. Okay, well, why do I care? I care because of this lemma, called the deletion contraction lemma. If I want to compute the chromatic polynomial of G, all I need to do is compute the chromatic polynomial of G with E deleted and subtract the polynomial of G with E contracted. Why is this useful? Well, think about it. If G has a certain number of edges, M, say, how many edges does G with E deleted have? Pretty clearly M minus one, right? Because I deleted one of the edges. What about G with E contracted? Well, that has at most minus one edges, right? Because I got rid of the edge E, but I also may have collapsed other edges. So it certainly isn't any greater than M minus one. So what have I done? I've expressed the chromatic polynomial of G with a certain number of edges in terms of chromatic polynomials of graphs with fewer edges. This is a perfect recursion to apply induction on the number of edges. Okay, so let's prove this. It's really easy to prove. So um, <coughs> just to give things names, suppose E is the edge going from V to X. And now I'm going to get rid of the minus sign by bringing the G with E contracted over to the other side of the equation. So I'm gonna prove this in the form that the chromatic polynomial of G with E deleted is the chromatic polynomial of G plus the chromatic polynomial of G with E contracted. Now think about it. If I remove that edge E, then the proper colorings of that graph come in two flavors, chocolate and vanilla. No, the two flavors are either the vertices V and X Kyle, you like my jokes. That's good. I, I appreciate that. Either the vertices V and X have different colors or they have the same color, right? Because we've removed the edge between them. So there's nothing to prevent us from coloring them with the same color. 
But again, think about it. If I properly color G with E deleted, and I also assume the color of, the, of V and X, which were the endpoints of V, are different, then I'm essentially properly coloring G, right? So the number of ways that is P of G. Let's go back to the example so you can see it, right? Here's a coloring of G with E deleted, which has this guy. And notice the endpoints are different of E, which were of E, are of different colors. Well, I can just lift that to a coloring of the original graph, right? I just put in the edge E, I leave all the colors the same, and it's still proper because I had assumed that these two guys had different colors. What about if I'm coloring my original graph, uh, sorry, the graph with E deleted and the two vertices have the same color. Well, by a similar token, that's the number of ways to do that is just the number of ways to color G with E contracted. Again, go back to the example. Here is a coloring of this graph with E deleted where the endpoints have the same color. They're both red. Well, then we can list to a color of G over E where all of the other vertices, the old vertices have the same color that they did before, in this case, black and blue. And the color of the new vertex is just the com common color of the two vertices that we collapsed. And so hopefully that shows you that we're done, right? Finished, end of story. Questions, any questions? Good, thanks, glad you like it, Alex. Any other, oh, and Jesse too, we've got, we've got some, people who are following this. Excellent. Okay, so this is, I'm just reminding you what deletion contraction looks like. And now we can prove famous theorem of George Burkhoff from 1912, so over 100 years ago, that if we have a graph, P of G is always a polynomial in T. How do we prove this? Well, given the deletion contraction law, I think we want to use induction on the number of edges, right? So let's set this up to do that, just exactly that. So suppose we say n is the number of vertices, m is the number of edges. Our base case will be when we're ducting on m, the number of edges, our base will be when m is zero. When m is zero, what does the chromatic polynomial look like? Well, think about it. We go to a vertex. There's two ways to color it. We go to the next vertex. There's exactly, Laura, Laura's got it, right? Each vertex is gonna be colored in one of T ways because there's no restrictions, there's no edges here. So the total will be T to the N, T for each vertex. This is a polynomial in T, okay? Very good. Well, now let's do the induction step. Suppose M is positive. If M is positive, then there must be some edge floating around. Pick your favorite edge, it doesn't matter which one and apply deletion contraction. And here I'm just reminding you that the deleted and contracted graphs have fewer edges. So P of G is P of G with E deleted minus P of G with E contracted. But by induction, both of these are polynomials. What happens when you take a polynomial and subtract another polynomial? You get a polynomial. <laughs> Right, polynomials are closed under subtraction. So we're done. Now, not only is deletion contraction a very powerful method of proving things about the chromatic polynomial, it also can help you actually compute chromatic polynomials. So let's go back and look at that four cycle that was giving us conniption fits before and try and compute the chromatic polynomial now using deletion contraction. So let's pick out that edge E and now we'll delete and contract. So if we delete, we get this path. And if we contract, we get this triangle. And now we can go from vertex to vertex, right? In the here, we start at that vertex, t ways, then t minus one, then t minus one, then t minus one. So that'll give me t times t minus one cubed. Similarly here, it's t, t minus one, and t minus two. We can factor out a t times t minus one, and we're left with this quadratic. And notice, if you apply the quadratic formula to this, 
that quadratic has complex roots. So as I was saying before, this chromatic polynomial does not necessarily factor over the integers. You can get, and in fact, there's a whole area of graph theory where they study which complex numbers can be roots of chromatic polynomials. Okay, so there's George David Burkhoff, not to be confused with Garrett Burkhoff, who was also a famous mathematician and his son. Okay, so now as I've said, I wanna give you two examples where the chromatic polynomial comes up in places where you would not expect it to be. And we're gonna start with acyclic orientations. So an or orientation of a graph is just a directed graph or digraph, O, which is obtained by essentially taking each UV, which you think of as a two-way street, and replacing it by one-way streets going one way or the other, going either from U to V or from V to U, and these are called arcs. So I'm sure you're surprised that I'm using this graph again, but yes. Um, uh, Christopher, what's your, the polynomial is always zero. Oops, it went away. It didn't give me enough time to read it. Christopher, I have to hold that question and we'll, we'll ask it during the, um, during the question and answer period. It, it, it flew away before I could possibly, uh, read the whole thing. <laughs> One of the bad things about technology. So here's a graph. And here's an orientation, right? I've just put little arrows on each of the edges telling you which way we go. So now let's ask, if I've got a graph with M edges, how many orientations are there? Well, I just go to each edge and I orient it one of two ways. So the total is just going to be two to the number of edges. Yes, thanks Aram, that's exactly what it is. Two to the M where M is the number of edges. Clearly, this problem is too easy to write a paper about it. So we're going to have to make it soup it up a little bit to something that's more difficult to solve. And we'll do that by looking at acyclic orientations. But I've got to tell you what a cycle is before I tell you what it means to be acyclic. A cycle in an orientation, it's kind of what you think. You've got a sequence of vertices, V1, V2, up through VK, such that there's an arc going from V1 to V2, V2 to V3, et cetera, et cetera, and then VK all the way back to V1. Uh, is this orientation that we have here acyclic? Yeah, because try and go around this cycle. That's the only cycle there is. If I do it this way, I'm going the wrong way down this edge, the vertical edge. And if I try and do it this way, I'm going the wrong way across this horizontal edge. So this has no cycles in it. So, uh, come on, there we go. Let's try and count acyclic orientations. So number of acyclic orientations of this graph is what? Well, pretty clearly we first need to work acyclically orienting the triangle and then we can also worry about this edge. The way that I do the triangle and the way that I do the edge will have no interaction between the two. How many ways are there to acyclically orient the triangle? Well, think about it. How many total ways are there to orient the triangle? Two cubed, right? Because the triangle has three edges. We just said the total number of orientations is two to the number of edges, so that's two cubed. Of those, how many are cycles? Two, either I can work, yeah, there you go. Good, Lizzie. You can either do it cyclically clockwise or counterclockwise. There's two orientations. The number of acyclic orientations is the total number of orientations, two cubed, minus the number that give you a cycle, which is minus two. And I've clearly for this edge, there's two ways to orient it, and neither of them will give you a cycle. So if you give that to your favorite uh, supercomputer and let it crank for a few hours, hopefully it will give you that this is 12. Okay, so that's the number of acyclic orientations. Now, you probably some of you are thinking, has Dr. Sagan gone crazy? I mean, he's talking about these acyclic orientations. This, there is nary a coloring instinct. But just hold your horses. Things are coming. But I'm going to do something first which is going to convince you that I've got to be crazy. I'm going to take the chromatic polynomial for G, 
and I'm going to plug in minus one. Now, what it means to color a graph with minus one colors is not clear, but again, just humor me. I'm an old man. Plug in minus one and get this. Oh, yes, I know Hayden is just, what am I doing? How can I do this? I just did it. And I compute this out, and I get 12. Guess what? Those two 12s are the same 12. Yes, yes. Ah, I see a lot of you are as excited about this as I am. Okay, thanks, Jasmine. This is a theorem of Richard Stanley, my advisor. If I take any graph and I plug minus one into its chromatic polynomial, I do this crazy substitution, it gives you up to a sign the number of acyclic orientations of G. Yeah, Patty, I agree. When, when I saw this theorem first, I just kind of almost lost it. It's such a beautiful and amazing theorem. In fact, I was so infatuated with it that I, with my co-author Andreas Bloss, trying to understand what was really going on, finally were able to give a bijective proof of this theorem. So there's Richard Stanley, my, my former advisor. There's my co-author, Andreas. Okay, so that's, that is the acyclic orientation world. Now let's go on and talk about hyperplanes. Okay, what is a hyperplane? A hyperplane in Rn, it's just a subspace with codimension one. So of dimension n minus one, one less than the ambient space. And then an arrangement of hyperplanes, just a set of hyperplanes. Pick out some hyperplanes. So notice all our hyperplanes are going to go through the origin. So for example, if we're in R2, the hyperplanes in R2 are lines. So here's an arrangement with the line y equal 2x and the line y equal minus x. And I can visualize that as those two lines. Now notice I've left out the coordinate axes, and that's because of things to come. But there are the two lines, y equals 2x and the lines y, right? y equals 2x and y equals minus x. So we're going to be concerned with the regions of the arrangement. The regions of the arrangement are you take your ambient space, Rn, and you remove the hyperplanes. What you get when you remove it breaks up into connected components. Count those components are called the regions. And we're going to be counting the regions of a hyperplane arrangement. So for example, in this, ex in this example, how many regions would there be? Four, right? Because if I take a of the, that piece of paper and I cut along the blue line and I cut along the red line, space is going to fall apart into four pieces, OK? And now you must be thinking, oh, Bruce is completely lost at this time. I mean, there's not even a graph here. What's he talking about? Again, just wait. So suppose this common combinatorial notation, brackets n is the numbers 1 through n. Suppose we have a graph, and suppose the vertices are the numbers 1 through n. Then there is an associated arrangement called A of G. And what you do is you take any edge, i, j, in the edge set. Remember, i and j are now numbers between 1 and n. And you associate with that edge the hyperplane where you set the ith coordinate equal to the jth coordinate. Okay, so again, let's look at an example. In that graph, so the hyperplanes here would be in R3, because there's three vertices. That first edge, 1, 2, would give you the hyperplane x1 equal to x2, right? So the coordinates here are x1, x2, and x3. And this edge would give us the hyperplane x1 equal to x3. Or if you prefer x, y, z coordinates, this would be x equal to y, and this would be x equal to z. OK, again, let's ask, how many regions are there? Well, think about it. I remove this first hyperplane, how many regions do I get? Two, right, the two sides of the hyperplane. I remove the second one, what happens? Each of those two regions breaks into two regions for a total of four. Now, the number of regions isn't always a power of two, but in this simple arrangement, it is. So the number of regions is four. 
And now I'm going to do the same crazy thing. I'm going to take the chromatic polynomial, which is easy to compute, t weighs for this one, t minus 1, t minus 1, so t times t minus 1 squared. And I'm going to put in minus 1, and lo and behold, I get a minus 4. And this illustrates a theorem of Zaslavsky's, which says that if I take a graph whose vertices are the numbers 1 through n, and I plug minus 1 into that polynomial, I get up to assign the number of regions of the associated arrangement. Now, seeing Stanley's theorem and Zaslavsky's theorems back to back, you might suspect that there's a bijection between acyclic orientations and regions of the hyperplane arrangement, right? Because they're both gotten by plugging minus one into the chromatic polynomial. This is true. And again, I can discuss that more during question and answer if we have time. Okay, so there's Tom Soslowski. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Because we're at the end of the section. This is a good time if there are any questions. I wanted to ask, um, what does what do the degrees of the irreducible factors of the chromatic polynomial tell you about the graph? Uh huh. If anything, they tell you something. Um, they the, de the degree one factors tell you something. I don't know that the necessarily the degree two and higher factors tell you anything. Um, I'm, but I'm also not an expert. As I said, there's a whole area of graph theory where they study the roots. And probably to get a better answer, you'd want to ask somebody who works in that area. And I can send you, if you email me, I'll be happy to send you the names and, and emails of some people who work in that area um, that you could ask that question of and probably get a better answer than I can give you. So, any other questions? Okay, so let's go on and talk. Now I'm going to be talking about my own work on increasing forests and what this has to do with the chromatic polynomial. So I've got to define some things so that you'll know what we are talking about. So we'll say that a graph F is a forest if it has no undirected cycle. So now we're back in graph land, not in orientation land. So we're talking about an ordinary graph. Ordinary cycle is like a directed cycle, except you don't need to worry about orientations. And then we also need to know what it means for a subgraph of a graph to be spanning. Well, a subgraph is just you take your graph and take some subset of the vertices and some subset of the edges. That subgraph is spanning if you always take all the vertices of your graph to be in the subgraph. So basically, in a, a spanning subgraph, you're just taking a subset of the edges. All the vertices are always there. So suppose G is a graph. Again, we're going to want to have the vertices be 1 through n, and suppose f is a spanning forest. So here's an example. I'm, again, it's the same example we've been using, but now notice I put the numbers 1 through 4 as vertices labels. And here's a spanning forest, right? It uses all four of the vertices, and I broke that one cycle we had by removing the edge 1, 4. Okay? Questions about what a spanning forest is. Now we're going to be concerned with a specific type of spanning forest, which is called increasing. So a forest is increasing if, when I go to any component in that forest, the components of a forest are called trees. So these are the connected bits. If I go to any tree in the forest, and I look at its minimal vertex, the small, remember the, num, the vertices are labeled one through n, so I can talk about a smallest vertex. And I walk out from that vertex on any path that I see. If the sequence of vertex labels I see on any such path is increasing, then the forest is called increasing. So let's look at this forest that I've got in the example. Is that increasing? Well, there's two trees. First of all, there's the trivial tree, which is just the vertex three. 
if I start at the vertex three, there's nowhere to walk. So that just gives me the sequence three. A one element sequence is always increasing. So that's an increasing tree. What about this tree? Well, again, I go to the minimum vertex, which is one, and I walk out on the only path that I see, and I get one, two, four, which is an increasing sequence. So this is an increasing tree. What about this spanning forest? No, it's not increasing, right? Because if I start at the vertex one here and go out, I get the sequence one, four, two. So that's not increasing. So we're going to be interested in studying increasing spanning forests. And as we often do in combinatorics, rather than studying the number of such forests individually, we're going to put these into something called the generating function, which is a certain type of polynomial. So just to set up notation, ISF, which stands for increasing spanning forest, sub M, M is going to be the number of edges. So this is just the number of increasing spanning forests in my graph that have exactly M edges. And then I turn this into a polynomial, which I'm going to call capital ISF of G. <coughs> and I do that by making these guys, these things that I'm interested in, the number of spanning forests with M edges, the coefficients of powers of T. Notice the coefficients of powers of T here are a little strange because I'm making it the coefficient of T to the N minus M where n is the number of vertices. And I'm also adding these negative signs for reasons that will become apparent in a little bit. So right now, this is just a definition, which I'm going to repeat on the next slide so you have it. But again, to get used to what this thing looks like, let's compute it for the example. Yeah, oh, Lizzie, that's a great question. So Lizzie asked, does this depend upon the, num the labeling of the vertices? And the answer is yes. So even though my notation does not reflect it, ISFG should really be ISFG, the labeled graph, because if I take the same graph and label it two ways, I can get different polynomials. Excellent question. Any other questions about the, these concepts before we compute the example? Okay, so how many spanning forests are there, increasing spanning forests, with no edges. I claim there's one, right? Because if I have no edges, what am I doing? I'm just taking the four points with no edges between them. We just saw in the last example that any single point is an increasing tree, because you only have the trivial path. So there, I'm going to have just one way to do it just the four lone vertices. What about if I'm allowing myself one edge? Well, think about it. If I've got a, a tree that consists of one edge, it's got a smaller vertex and a larger vertex. So if I walk from the smaller vertex to the larger vertex, is that an increasing sequence? Yeah. So any single edge is an increasing tree. So ISF1 is just the number of edges, which in this case is four. Things get more complicated when we get to two edges. So right, four choose two is the number of taking number of ways of taking two edges of those four edges, all possible ways. But some of those are not going to be increasing. We saw one on the last slide. So that's why I have to subtract one. Because I that one that I've shown you there is not increasing. Similarly, for three edges, I force three is the total number of ways of picking three of the edges, and two of them turn out not to be increasing spanning forests. So I get subtracting, I get two. How many way, how many increasing spanning forests are there if I pick all four edges? Zero, right? Because if I pick all four edges, I'm picking the graph, right? I'm picking all the edges. Is that graph an increased spanning forest? No, it's not even a forest, right? We've got a cycle. So it's not, it's not a forest to begin with. So that's that. So now we put these into our polynomial, right? So the one becomes, because of this way we did the indexing, the highest coefficient, the coefficient of t to the fourth. Notice this makes our mo polynomials monic. 
IF0 is always going to be 1, which is one of the reasons for this strange change of power of t. And then we just go down using these as the coefficients and alternating signs. So minus 4t cubed plus 5t squared minus 2t and no constant term. And you will notice that this factors nicely over the integers. You may also notice that this was the chromatic polynomial of that graph. Let me deal with those two observations separately. Let me first show you why this, this polynomial always in factors over the integers. Why is that? Well, take G, vertices are one through N, and define the following subsets of the vertex set. V sub A is the set of all vertices I that are smaller than J. Again, remember that vertices are one through N, so we can talk about one vertex being smaller than another. So V sub J is all smaller I that are connected to J by an edge. Back to our usual graph, what is V sub 1? Trick question. V sub 1 is the empty set, right? Because remember, V sub 1, we need to look for vertices smaller than 1. Are there any vertices smaller than 1? Clearly not. So this is empty. What's V sub 2? Well, here's 2. Is it connected to anything of smaller label? Yeah, 1. So this just consists of the set 1. What about 3? Three? 3 is connected to the smaller vertex 2. And then finally, 4 is connected to both the smaller vertices 1 and 2. And now, just for laughs, let's look at the polyol we get by taking t minus the cardinality of v1 times t minus the cardinality of v2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. What do I get? t minus 0 here, so that's just going to give me a t. These will both give me t minus 1, because they're of cardinality 1. This gives me t minus 2, because that's of cardinality 2. This was the increasing spanning forest polyol. And as I'm, yes, I know, Rob, isn't this amazing? Valerie, I agree with you. I was very impressed when we found this theorem. So this is a theorem of myself and my then graduate student, Josh Hallam, who's now uh, on a tenure track at Loyola Marymount. If I've got a graph and I've, thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Peggy. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of this theorem. Of course, I'm biased, but I'm, I am proud of it. Um, the increasing spanning forest polynomial always factors over the integers and the roots are just the sizes of these VJs. And uh, there's a picture of Josh. Meta question, how did you notice the relation? Ah, right. The, this came from, so the question was, how did we notice the relationship between this, the factoring of this polynomial and the VJs? I've swept under the rug where this actually came from. And it came from a study of partially ordered sets, and in particular, a theory of partially ordered sets that Josh and I came up with. So this is a very, I'm showing you the cleaned up version, but we came at it from a very roundabout way, which um, I can talk a little bit more about during the question and answer session if necessary, or not if necessary, if there's time. But it's it definitely was not as direct as what you saw. And But it wasn't, we didn't pull it out of the air either. There, was a, there were good reasons for looking at this set of vertices. That's just a, re a, a reminder of what that set looks like. <laughs> so it's clear that the increasing spanning forest polynomial cannot always be equal to the chromatic polynomial. We've seen two reasons why. Because remember, we said the increasing spanning forest polynomial depends upon the labeling of the graph that you give it. Does the chromatic polynomial? No. It's the same whatever labels you give to the, the vertices. The other difference is we just showed you that the increasing spanning forest polynomial always factors over the integers. And I went out of my way to give you an example where the P did not. So we can't ask, we can't prove that they're always equal because they're always equal, but we can ask when are they equal. 
And this is answered in the following way. And unfortunately, I need a couple more definitions for this. So if I've got a subset of vertices of a graph, G brackets W will be the induced subgraph. That means I remove all the vertices not in W and their adjacent edges, and we just look at what remains. And then a clique in a graph, or sometimes called a complete subgraph, is just a subgraph where every pair of vertices in the subgraph is connected by an edge. Going back to our usual example, so here is the graph induced on the ed on the vertices one, two, and four, right? I removed the vertex three and its edge, and this is what I was left with. Is this a clique? Yeah. So, yes, good, Valerie, yes. Right, because I've one, two, and four are all connected to each other. Here's the graph induced by two, three, four. I removed one and its two edges. This is pretty clearly not a clique, right? Because we are missing the edge three, four. So here is our condition. If I've got a graph, its vertices are one through n, then the chromatic polynomial and the increasing spanning force polynomial are equal if and only if we take these magical VJ sets that we just introduced and look at their corresponding induced subgraphs, if those are all cliques, then the polynomials are equal. And this is if and only if. If we do, don't get a quality, don't get a clique for one of these graphs, they aren't the same. Again, let's go back and look example. V1, remember, was the empty set, so the graph induced is the empty graph. That's kind of trivially a clique. V2 was just the vertex 1. That induces the vertex 1, which is also fairly trivially a clique. Similarly for V3, it just induces the vertex 2. The only one that's really interesting is V4. Remember, V4 had 1 and 2 in it. And if I looked at the induced graph, if I remove 3 and 4, I am left with a an edge between one and two and that's a nice small clique right because one and two are adjacent now you may be thinking what nightmare was bruce were bruce and josh having when they came up with this clique condition i should mention this condition was in graph theory long before we came on the scene this is a classic condition called having a perfect elimination order and it has to do with um, such things as chordal graphs and other stuff. Okay, so I think I have just enough time to give you some comments and open questions. So the first thing I should do is um, I should fess up and tell you that the theorems I've been telling you in this talk are all watered down. They are all special cases of the more general theorems that were proved by these people. The reason I did that was just because it's easier to see what these theorems are saying in special cases rather than with all the bells and whistles. But let me do due diligence and show you the full theorems. So we showed you what happens when you plug in minus one into the chromatic polynomial. Well, what about plugging in minus two or minus three or minus four? You can still say something. So let G be a graph, let O be an O's acyclic orientation, and now look at a coloring with T colored. Notice I said a coloring, not a proper coloring, just any coloring. We will say that the orientation and the coloring, thank you, Josh. Yeah, um, uh, we'll definitely be able to end before five minutes are up. Um, we say that the orientation and the coloring are compatible if every arc of the orientation points from a smaller colored vertex to a larger colored vertex. Remember, the colors are one through T, so they're ordered. So Stanley's full theorem is, if I plug any negative integer into T, get up to sign the number of compatible pairs. And you can check that with this theorem, if I set T, if I have minus one here, it gives you the number of acyclic orientations. It's easy to see why it reduces to that. And uh, 
very recently, in fact, this past year, I was able to give a bijective proof of that with Vince Matter, uh, which has just actually been accepted to the American Mathematical Monthly. So coming soon to a mag magazine near you. Thank you, thank you, Jasmine. So um, also I didn't give you the strongest form of Zaslavsky's theorem. So let me talk about an arbitrary hyperplane arrangement. So given any hyperplane arrangement, it does not have to come from a graph, there is an associated polynomial called the characteristic polynomial. Now I don't have time to define the characteristic polynomial in full generality, but just think of it as a black box. You hand the black box an arrangement and out pops a polynomial. And if you hand it an arrangement which came from a graph, the box will hand you back the chromatic polynomial. So this is a vast generalization of the chromatic polynomial. And so Zaslavsky's full theorem says that if I plug minus one into this newfangled characteristic polynomial, we always get up to sign the number of regions. So there's Vince Vatter. Uh, why I have Jeremy Martin on the slide is because I also gave short shrift to the stuff I told you about increasing forests. So together with Jeremy, Josh and I have extended all the results I've shown you to simplicial complexes of arbitrary dimension. So what is a simplicial complex? If you haven't had topology, you take simplices, which are just, are, um, they're like uh, tetrahedra, but in arbitrary dimension, and you paste them together along faces. Think about it though. If I take simplices of dimension one, those are just line segments. And if I paste line segments together along vertices, I get graphs. So when d, d is one here, I cover all of the theorems that I had before for graphs. But as I said, they, we, there are analogous theorems in higher dimension. One of the things that we would like to know why is this not? Oh dear. Something went wrong. Ah, I'm back, I think. Can people hear me? I hope so. Yes, good. I think my computer just had a, had a brain fart. Anyway, uh, so one can define inversions in a forest in such a way that increasing forests are exactly the ones that have no inversions. And there's some suggestions in our paper that we, there should be corresponding theorems for forests that have a positive number of inversions, but we haven't been able to find them. And I want to show you one of the most amazing developments in this uh, bailiwick recent ones. And this talks about something called log concavity. So a polynomial is log concave if when you take, you square the kth coefficient, it's greater than or equal to the product of the k minus first coefficient and the k plus first coefficient, the coefficients on either side. And this is a, actually a, an idea that came from statistics where this kind of uh, property comes up naturally, but it also comes up a lot in combinatorics, algebra, and topology. And fairly recently, using very deep methods from algebraic geometry, if, including churn classes and stuff which I know nothing about, Jun Ha has proved the following, that if I have a graph and I look at the chromatic polynomial, its coefficients are log concave. This is a theorem that graph theorists had been trying to prove for a number of years using graph theoretic techniques. Nobody was able to do it. June was able to do it though, but with only with very fancy algebraic geometry. And so another question is, is there a way to prove this combinatorially? And I should also mention that even more recently, Adeprasto, June, and Katz have given a combinatorial way of looking at Hodge theory, which proves something called the heron rota welsh conjecture, which generalizes June's result to any matroid. Don't have time to define matroids. 
But anyway, there's Karim, June, and Eric. And with that, thanks so much for listening. Yay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Rob, Jesse, Graham, Valerie, Casey. Great. So we have time for... Uh, yes, we do have time, so everybody is already thanking you, so I don't need to make that announcement. Uh, but if we had, we did have one question from Christopher from right. a while back, so let's start Tell with that and then we'll open up to others. Kind of blew by me with, thank you everyone for all the nice comments, that's great. Pastor, my question was just, um, finding the integer that's smaller than the chi value if you plug it in the chromatic polynomial and i guess positive ones you always get zero or could you get a negative number no you must get zero the reason why you must get zero is because of the fact that right remember the chromatic polynomial counts the number of proper colorings if i plug in a number smaller than the chromatic number there are no col right smaller than the chromatic number means that there are no proper colorings and so when you go to count them, you're counting the empty set. The number of elements in the empty set is zero. It's not, it's not minus five or something. The empty set has exactly zero elements. So this answers something of one of the earlier questions about, can you say anything about the factors? So you know for sure that your chromatic polynomial has factors zero, t, t minus one, t minus two, up to t minus one less than the chromatic polynomial. So those are, sorry, t minus one less than the chromatic number. So at least that tells you a little bit about the linear factors. And another question flew by, Christopher, does that answer your question? Good, excellent. Now I saw another question fly by, but it was too fast and too long. Can somebody- Alex, do you wanna you, um, ask it? <laughs> arrows Go. on the right hand side of your screen uh -huh. you should okay. be able to access the chat still right let me attend these chat okay let me see if i can open this up joshua Fenton. <coughs> okay i've got 72 messages there um if you just scroll down to the bottom i think alex's is pretty close to the end okay do you know if people study generating functions for the number of colorings um so the oh i see where you've got the the chromatic polynomial as your um right exactly exactly um so yeah i don't know whether they've been studied that's a great question that's a great question so the coefficients of your generating function would be chromatic polynomials but it's not, I'm drawing a blank as to whether there's anybody that's looked at them from that viewpoint. Certainly, if the chromatic polynomials come from what are called chordal graphs, in that case, the chromatic polynomials always factor over the integers. And in that case, you could, gener you could write down the generating function because we know what generating functions look like when you've got polynomial coefficients. Um, but in general, I, I don't know of anybody that's looked, that, that's definitely a question to ask math side at and see what, uh, there might very well be interesting things. It's a great question. Anything else? Ah, uh, I see, right. Polyn yes, so, when you do that early, so remember, again, when the, um, okay, so here's the way to think about this. When you have a number which is less than the chromatic number of all of the things, terms in your recursion for the deletion contraction law, then all the polynomials will be zero. So you'll get zero minus zero equals zero, which is not very interesting. You will never get that for higher numbers. And the reason for that is this. Remember, the chromatic polynomial counts the number of colorings where a coloring is a map from the vertices to a set with t colors. 
but it does not demand that you use all T colors, right? It's just a function. It's not necessarily a surjective function. So once you have one coloring with like five colors, then you have a coloring also where your range set has got six colors in it because you can just ignore the sixth color and use the five colors and that will still be counted, right? Because you're not insisting that you use all six colors. So once the polynomial is non-zero, it stays non-zero. Okay, does that answer your question? Great. Other questions? Um, yes. So if, if chi factors with linear factors, then there is a labeling with the equality. So that's, that's the if and only if. Remember, this was an if and only if condition. So the line, this, the, when it, in fact, we can tell you what the coefficients look like. And because of that, we can come up with a labeling. So thanks, Jeremy. Um, Alex. Yes. So to 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 go ahead with Jesse's comment, um, yes, the chromatic polynomial is the specialization of a function called the chromatic symmetric function, which was also introduced by Stanley. Um, and the chromatic symmetric function is you assign to each coloring a, a monomial, and then you add up the monomials. And you get the chromatic polynomial back by specializing the first t, poly, the first t variables to be 1 and all the rest to be 0. Um, but it's not, again, the, that wasn't quite the question Alex was asking. Alex was asking, use the chromatic polynomial as coefficients to a generating function. That's not how the symmetric function works. The symmetric function is generalizing the chromatic polynomial itself rather than turning it into a generating function. Um, yes. The, in fact, the, so the qu question is, the, is the chromatic fun symmetric function related to the tut polynomial? The tut polynomial, in fact, is a generalization of the chromatic polynomial. You can, tut polynomial is a polynomial in two variables, and if you specialize those variables in the right sort of way, you get the chromatic polynomial back. There, you can do a similar sort of thing where in the chromatic symmetric function, you can go and beef it up in a certain way, which then when you sub when you specialize variables gives you back the tut polynomial. So yes, there is a very good, very important relation there. Sure, pleasure, Josh. Um, so Caleb asked, what's the the um interest from complex analysis. I'm not sure that complex analysts are interested in the question, but the people that are interested in it are combinatorialists who study the chromatic polynomial and are asking questions like, okay, it can have complex roots, but where are those roots? Where do they lie in the complex plane? This kind of thing. So I, I don't know of any applications of those ideas to analysis, it's more going the other way. They're using techniques from analysis to tell us something about this um, combinatorial object. So that, 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 but as I said, again, I am definitely not an expert in this area of, of research on chromatic polynomials. So you might very well find something, do a, re, uh, a search on math SciNet and find uh, that I'm wrong, that there is some application to complex analysis. I just haven't seen it myself. Any other questions? Ah, what are inversions in force? Okay, very good. So, um, so remember what we were doing in each tree in the forest. We were starting at the smallest vertex and we were walking out on a path and we said it was increasing if that path was always an increasing sequence. 
Supposing it's not, an, suppose we don't get always an increasing sequence. Suppose we get some sequences which are out of order. So an inversion in a sequence is two numbers in that sequence where the larger number comes before the smaller number. So for example, in that example we gave in the slides, that sequence that we got from the non-increasing forest, one, four, two, that has an inversion between the four and the two because the four comes before the two, but it's larger than the two. So you can count the number of inversions then, right? So if we have no inversions, then all the paths are increasing. The one that I showed you wasn't increasing had exactly one inversion. So you can ask the question, suppose we want to count forests that have exactly one inversion. Can we say anything? And we say a little bit in the paper, which as I said is online on in my website, but it not it's not very satisfying. And I think there must be a lot more than can be said in the, in that direction. Yes, so four, two, three has two inversions. The four is bigger than the two, and the four is bigger than the three, right? So that counts as two inversions. If we had four, three, two, we would have three inversions, because then the four would be in with a three and the two, and the three and the two would also be out of order. There's, there's an, a vast literature on inversions and permutations. There's amazing stuff that can be said about them. They have beautiful things called Q analogs, um, you can read the, my new book, which is on my webpage for free, has a whole section about inversions and, and this sort of thing and permutations. There's a, so when you're just talking about a single permutation, there's lots that can be said, which is one of the reasons we think that we might be able to say something in this more general context where you've got trees. Other questions? Okay, thanks, Nagan. Thank you all for coming. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was great. It was a new experience. I've never given it out this way. Take care. Take care. Somebody's got a, their microphone on. They yeah. It up. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much again for coming. If everybody is already thanking you again, so I don't need to make that announcement twice. Um, Right. For everyone who is, so next thing that we have going on, we have lunch and a poster session going on right now. Um, if you want to pop over, you can just follow the links in the emails that Aaron sent. If you want to go to lunch and then just come back later, uh, we'll be starting breakout sessions uh, after that, I believe at 1 o'clock. So thank you all for being here. Um, thank you again, Dr. Sagan. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, nah, no problem. <laughs> um, okay, I think we're going to end this now. That's good. See you later tonight, today. Yes, see you later. <laughs>